Thank you everyone for being here. So it's uh, delightful for us to uh, welcome in Father Richard Rohr. So we uh, know that there's probably no better name to invite than other Father Richard. So we're delighted to have you here today. My privilege. Thank yeah. you. And uh, how about this, with this conversation, we wanted to hear just a little bit more about you, how you've become considered a thought leader in the field for not only, you know, and say your Catholic tradition, but also throughout the world, uh, but hopefully also to get into your book here that just released and I think something that would be valuable for us who want to create community and a sense of connection in our lives. So um, first I, I thought we um, just asked that I would uh, say a, an official bio for those, okay. those of us who have not already Googled you and figured out why you're here today. Uh, Father Richard Rohr is a globally recognized ecumenical teacher bearing witness to the universal awakening within Christian mysticism <coughs> and the perennial tradition. He is a Franciscan priest of the New Mexico Providence and founder of the Center for Action of Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Father Richard's teaching is grounded in the Franciscan alternate orthodoxy, practice of contemplation and self-emptying, expressing itself in radical compassion, particularly for those of the socially marginalized. Father Richard is the author of numerous best-selling books, books, including Everything Belongs, The Naked Now, Eager to Love, The New Alternative Way of St. Francis of Assisi, and his most recent book, which we'll talk about today, The Divine Dance, The Trinity and Your Transformation. So, uh, you know, spoke at, you know, great bio, but, you know, here at uh, Google, we, as I said, want to bring in great thought leaders, and it seems like you've not only, you know, been a part of your own tr Christian tradition, but you have been featured upon Oprah. You have, you're, you know, one of the keynote speakers to a conference of science and non-duality here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'm we're kind of curious, why have you come to be so popular for <laughs> such a vast, diverse group of audiences? Well, the obvious answer is I don't know, and it still surprises me. But it excites me, too, because uh, there's some convergence taking place now, you know? Mm -hmm. Some, Carl Jaspers called it second axial consciousness, that the little tribal levels where most of us live till very recently are on many levels just breaking apart, as I think they should. But of course, it's shocking for many people, as we see reflected in our politics. But it's also exciting for a lot of other people, as we see reflected in places like this, that uh, the identifiers that most of us grew up with, uh, we don't want to throw them out. Like, I don't throw out my Catholic background. And yet, as some of you might know, the word Catholic means universal. And the irony is that Catholicism has not been universal up to now. It's been very tribal, been very ethnic. And uh, for some reason, I'm in a position to, to, to rely upon what we call the perennial tradition, the big picture, you know, not just one tribe's understanding, but the bigger tribe. And um, the time seems to be right for that, with not everybody, but an awful lot of people. And uh, I would have never expected this, planned this. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm standing on the side watching it happen myself, really, and, and trying to make my contribution. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I know a lot of people have even, you know, coming from this perennial tradition, called you a modern mystic. Um, and often, I don't know, you've written even books on St. Francis, and people would say you would be a modern day St. Francis. And, you know, so what does that actually mean for us who <laughs> say this mystic yeah. is this kind yeah. of word yeah. up in the cloud? And, uh, for me, myst I try to bring the word mystic down to earth. It simply means experiential knowledge. Uh, whereas what most of us have grown up with is book knowledge, uh, textbook knowledge, uh, as it were. Uh, uh, quoting other experts or quoting authorities, and there's a place for that. That's good. I can do that too, but that's just education. And what what the mystical knowing does is it transforms your consciousness, your psyche. It doesn't tell you uh, what to see, but how to see, and you you look out from a different pair of eyes. So I think there's probably more mystics. And I know that sounds like such a sophisticated word, but I think there's probably more mystics around than we realize. And they're not always people who went to university. You know? <laughs> they're usually people who've walked journeys of great love and great suffering, as I put it. Mm. And that, 
they've allowed those experiences to broaden their perspective mm -hmm. and to deepen their perspective. So um, if that's true, I hope it is true. I, I don't think I could write or say the things I do if I had just depended upon what I'd learned in seminary or learned in textbooks. And I bet a lot of you would say that in your field too. Uh, and that's what's happening now that we're learning how to trust that mm -hmm. uh, and say, you know, it doesn't just have to be quoting a, a scholar who lived in the 17th century or any century. But is there a knowing, I call it knowing by participation, uh, this conference I'm at here is on consciousness itself. And Chopra was talking last night about, you know, how all the best scientists and scholars in the world, no one can explain what consciousness is. What is it? And yet it's something that we share in. Uh, not something that's uh, a secretion of the private brain, but something that we plug into. And I, I, I'm going to say it. I think the, the main plug-ins are great love and great suffering. Mm. Those are the things that allow people to, to change their source of how they know. And I hope in some little way I'm, I'm trying to do that. Oh, yeah, and we'll uh, definitely get back to the topic of great suffering as it applies to your book. I think that's, um, <clears throat> but one of the most requested questions that we had uh, posed to our group beforehand was I actually kind of wanted to hear what is in the day of the life of Richard Ward look like. Because oh. uh, I think, especially for us that, you know, here at Google, we uh -huh. are attached to our mobile phones, no. our laptops, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. And so for us, it sounds pretty glorious to, to you know, go to a monastery, which I think many of us have done those. Much, but like, what would it look like? What does a normal day look well, like? Well, you won't you? be that impressed, I'm going <laughs> to tell you. Uh, <laughs> if you now, I have, I'm 73 now, so my practice uh, of, of uh, Franciscan solitude and simplicity formed me before I realized it was forming me. And so without a wife, without children, I have, for example, opportunity to go away for extended periods. So for years, I would take the Lenten period, as we call it, the 40 days before Easter, uh, alone in a hermitage. Now, that's where I wrote my best books. I think that's where I could more easily plug in mm -hmm. to that big mind, that big heart that is bigger than me. Uh, and that's a luxury that most people don't have, you know, mm -hmm. it really is. So I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, makes me better, it's a freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, little did I think it would lead to that. But now I, I live in a very little casita uh, in uh, back of the, away from a large Mexican-American parish in Albuquerque. So I have the nice connection between the normal life of people, but a little bit of separation and solitude. Mm -hmm. So I wake up usually early in the morning. I uh, make my cup of coffee to get these <laughs> things stirring up here and uh, usually light a candle. Uh, I have an icon of that, uh, right, what yeah. is the cover of the Trinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's on top of my hearth, and uh, usually I take pretty much the first hour for meditation, for journaling. I, I have usually half a dozen different books scattered around me. Maybe a lot of you do that. And I just arbitrarily, well, this is the one for today, <clears throat> to, to sort of get, again, my juices going. Uh, and it's a good way to start. Then I go over to the center, which is around the corner, the Center for Action and Contemplation. And the staff, they, it's not required, but they're welcome to join. And we have a 20-minute contemplative sit where we sit in silence for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's a good way to start the day. Uh, and here, here's what I teach people. I don't know, but, you know, so often Christians, at least, or people from organized religion will say, how long should I pray? or meditate, use what, or contemplate, I don't care what word you use. Um, I say you should do it as long as it takes you to get to a foundational yes. And if you can get there in two minutes, that's really great. But you'll usually find there's, there's all kind of barriers and, and uh, resistance and negativity and leftover relationships from yesterday and all of that gunk just keeps coming up, you know. So it's not uncommon for me that it takes the full 20 minutes with the staff. Mm. 
before I can get from all my little no's, my little resistances, my little negativities, my judgments, my critiques, uh, to a foundational, it's okay. I, I can say yes to today. Uh, so I think that's supposed to be the point of what we call prayer, meditation, contemplation, to, to free this from all of its gunk. Is that a word? I don't know. Oh, but no. it, it, you know what I mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, then the rest of the day I go over and work, with, you know, have appointments and people and visitors and mm -hmm. do writing, uh, do those daily meditations that apparently some of you see. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, every day is different. No two days, depending on who shows up and what's in the email box. So I should yeah. say that too. I mean, I don't live a life... I'm certain St. Francis did not have an email box. So. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, wow, does it allow me to connect with people, you know, mm. in Singapore, in Cambodia, in Africa. What a gift mm. that people can ask you their questions or share with you their, their problems. Uh, what a gift. So it, it, it allows me to have the localized, concrete, specific life, and yet a you know, virtual life like Google is so well known for, you know, and facilitates. So I, I just, I'm very blessed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want to uh, go back to what you mentioned during the Lenten periods that you will turn out one of these books. And while doing my research on this, I heard you comment in another <clears throat> interview saying this was the book you've always wanted to write. Yeah, uh, you feel like yeah. you can be done after this. I can this. die after this. Um, yeah. And so, you know, why is that? I mean, because looking at a, you know, a topic well, on the Trinity, something like is not a, you know, the scholarly topic, you know that, but I'll let you take it from here because I'm sure you're okay. getting that asked a lot. Too. Yeah. Well, I don't know how many of you were raised Christian, <clears throat> but um, all mainline Christians would would never question a certain belief and that was called the holy trinity the blessed trinity that god is not one and god is not three god is both one and three and most of us like i was raised in kansas believe it or not nice flat boring kansas raised by irish nuns and i i start the book with this story where uh, she'd raise up the shamrock as any good irish was supposed to do and said, God is like this, but don't think about it. Because it wasn't anything you could think about, you know? It was beyond linear uh, processing by any form. And uh, Karl Rahner, who you said you studied, huh? It was the German Jesuit who was the, one of the experts at the Vatican Council in the 1960s. <clears throat> he said, uh, for all practical purposes, most Christians are monotheists. We didn't want to offend our Jewish ancestors, and we didn't know how to put one and three together, so we let it settle for a mathematical conundrum and pretty much shelved the whole doctrine. No one would deny it, Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox. Now, the Orthodox were probably the best of all, but for all practical purposes, it didn't compute, you know? and it certainly didn't have any practical transformative uh, meaning. So that's why we gave it the subtitle, The Trinity and Your Transformation. Let me, let me I won't take too long with this, I, although I'm very much oversimplifying it. For those of you familiar with the scriptures in the first chapters of Genesis, there are several, well, several, almost every line is astounding when you really study it. It has to be inspired. Uh, not to understand it literally, but to understand it transformationally, which is the best way to understand a spiritual text. Uh, where if you look at Genesis 1, 26, 27, it says, let us create in our image. And this was always problematic for our Jewish friends and ancestors, you know. Why is Yahweh, God, using the plural pronoun twice, let us create in our image. No one denies that's in the oldest texts. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, I believe it reflects what became the template for, now we call it the atom, by the way, the atomic universe, that everything in the universe is relational. You're experts if you work here at Google at understanding this. You really are. 
that nothing is autonomous, nothing is self-sufficient, nothing stands alone. I would say the single biggest heresy, if I can use that word, that is sort of anesthetized active Christianity is this very static notion of God and very static notion of the self. And they didn't know how to relate to one another because they were both static, if you can follow me. For all practical purposes, and I don't want to offend anybody, but the op and I've been a priest now 47 years, uh, the operative image of God, for most Catholics at least, I can only pick on Catholics because I'm one of them, you know, <laughs> uh, the operative image of God, and the, it's even given away in the phrase that you hear on television so often, the man upstairs. How often have you heard that in your life? The man upstairs. Yeah, with a gray beard. Yeah, and, he always uh, has a yeah, white beard. Or <laughs> and he's a man. And he's white. He's always white, you know. Uh, the whole thing, I'm going to again say something that will seem like an overstate. That's heresy. That's garbage. It doesn't come close to what was supposed to be the Christian revelation. But it is so much in the hard wiring of almost all people. It's basically Santa Claus. It basically is. There is not much difference between the little story of Santa Claus that you and I grew up with if you grew up in the States. Uh, making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. I call him early on in the book a critical spectator. Critical and spectator. Right? This is not a participatory universe. It's that early book that was for years my bestseller called Everything Belongs. I always said the only reason I think it sold well is people loved the title. They knew that had to be true, that if it was, it had to belong somehow. How did it get here if it wasn't a part of the whole equation, you know? And um, we, uh, we, we had a universe where, unfortunately, God ended up being the one deciding who doesn't belong. <laughs> really, I, I don't know how you were raised, but... At this point in history, and I'm still a bona fide Christian, and believe it or not, I'm a priest in good standing with the Franciscans and the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. But uh, much of Christian history has been preoccupied with exclusion. It has. Who does not belong? Heretics, women, witches, sinners, gays, every century and every culture just decided which group was not worthy to belong. This is a scary universe, if that's true, if God is a critical spectator. So what I try to present in the book is God as the, instead of critical spectator, replace that with ultimate participant, ultimate participant, all right? Uh -huh. if, if everything is created in the image of God, and everything is whirling around one another, which now the conference I'm attending right now is trying to affirm, and scientists, scientists are saying this better than clergymen. Do you understand? <laughs> clergymen seem preoccupied with who doesn't belong. And scientists are looking for universal field theories that show you everything has to belong or it wouldn't be here, you know. Um, so it's a great humiliation to those of us raised as clergymen to recognize there's bigger seers. We always thought theology was the queen of the sciences, the, the top of the field, but it's showing itself not to be the case because most of our theologies, even most Western uh, denominational Christians, as good as they were in this regard or that regard, uh, with this insight or that clarification, uh, invariably were historically uh, limited. <laughs> You know, historical accidents. God bless dear Martin Luther, and as a Catholic, I'm not against Martin Luther. Maybe some of you are Lutherans. But, you know, his, his reforms were simultaneous with the invention of the printing press that highly, highly influenced the entire Protestant Reformation, which was all about words. Words, 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 words. Not nature anymore, which we see in the native religions or even ancient Hinduism. Uh, much more based in, in what we Franciscans call the first Bible. And the first Bible was creation, which existed 
Now some say 13.6 billion years, some say 14.5 billion years, give a few years or two. But basically, now, now I'm still a Christian, don't throw me out right now, what, what I want to say, all right. But Jesus appeared in the last nanosecond of December 31st in terms of geological time. Did God have nothing to say for 14 billion years? Was God uninvolved? Was that not already the first manifestation? Of course it was, you know? Of course it was. Now, I'm still a believer that when consciousness was ready for interface, first letter of John, you know, we needed one we could see and touch, that the whole macrocosmic revelation, we believe, and only Christians believe this, I'm not saying you have to if you're not a Christian, but we do believe that he was the image of the invisible God, that he became in personified form that we could see and touch and fall in love with the eternal Christ. The Christ started at the Big Bang. You know? The Jesus emerged 2,000 years ago. Now, if you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus Christ. Most are trained in Jesus, good Jesus theology, or sometimes not so good Jesus theology. Uh, but very few were taught to recognize the cosmic Christ, the eternal Christ that existed since the beginning of time. That includes everything. That includes the Stone Age people, the Mayan Empire, the Babylonian Empire. All those were not throwaway people. And, and you would have thought monotheists, the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you'd think we would have been the first in line to recognize that. We said there's one God who created all things, all things, got it? I was raised with an old document called the Baltimore Catechism. Any old Catholics here? You know, we all were trained on the Baltimore Catechism. And six, question 16 in the Baltimore Catechism was, where is God? And little Catholic kids, we parroted back the answer to the good nuns. And she said, where is God? And we said, God is everywhere as a whole class. You know. But we didn't believe it. And God certainly wasn't in India you know, or in China, or <laughs> it all, you know, the whole thing just started falling apart. When we had the global access that Google and Apple and all these wonderful technologies have given us. So either we have a God, forgive this long answer. I, no, this e great. E <laughs> either we have a God who's at least as big as what we now know is the shape of the universe. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're the first generation, you know, that benefits from the Hubble telescope. And not only is it expanding, but it's expanding at a bigger rate. It's fast. It's accelerating outward faster. And that's how they were able to count back to 14.6 billion or whatever it is. This is just mind-blowing, you know. Uh, we have to have a God who... Who is dynamic, who is in movement, who is in relationship, who is participatory. Uh, again, uh, you know, look how Christians resisted evolution. <laughs> we should have again been the first in line. It's obvious everything is growing, everything. And all the sciences recognize that. Nothing is static in the universe. And who are the people fighting it the most? The clergy, you know? Well, fundamentalist clergy, at least. You know, we want an inert world because that gives us a sense of being in control. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I try to come at it in so many angles in the book, but yeah. well, I'm basically trying to say that we've got to have a God who's participatory, relational, inherent, not an additive that occasionally dips into history and does mm -hmm. nice things to nice people and burns bad people for all eternity. Uh, when, and, you know, the kind of cruelty and anger we're seeing right now in our politics, I think is the final effect of centuries of not preaching the gospel. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we got so many angry Christians. Huh? But uh, and I'm making a big connection. You don't have to agree with it, but I'm going to say it strongly. If God is an eternal torturer, Making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. 
basically excluding, 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 always judging people to be unworthy, unworthy. No wonder we have universal low self-esteem in America, you know? And we were meant to be the people who were supposed to solve that at the beginning by telling people you are inherently, objectively, metaphysically, ontologically, by reason of your birth or conception, children of God with inherent dignity. We were supposed to be the people that assured you of your dignity. And it didn't come from your race, your good looks, your money, your health, uh, you know, your ethnicity, your being born in America, your being having white skin. Uh, and that's all the things we've been relying on in Christian countries. You see, so uh, what I, I think I say in the book... I think history, I don't know how long we're going to last, but I think we're around for a long time. I don't know what the future is going to be like, but it seems to be here. Um, I think the first 2,000 years of Christianity are going to be called baby Christianity, early, early Christianity. We're just beginning to get the point of the revelation. So let me do, I'll end on this, Nick, and you can come back to me. But, uh, you know, I know as a priest, when I'm reading any of the uh, uh, Gospel of John uh, from the pulpit, I can just see all the Catholics' eyes glaze over. Oh, God, here goes John again. The Father and the Son and the Spirit, and I am in you, and you are in me, and I'm giving him to you, and he's coming from me. It took Christianity three centuries to unpackage that. And this is the, the name of the book. Maybe you were never told this. You, you studied theology, so you probably were. But uh, they came up with a word from Greek theater. And this, if you studied systematic theology, you all know this word. The word in, is peri, around Greek, choresis, choreography, your word comes from. God is like a circle dance. So that's why I named the book The Divine Dance. Um, so they had a very dynamic notion of God after reflecting on especially John's gospel for three centuries. And this became the official dogma, doctrine of Christianity. But after clarifying it with this marvelous word, God is ultimate relationality, like a spinning top of love inside of every created creature. Not just humans, but animals and plants. It's called photosynthesis. You know? Everything lives from within and grows and develops and expands. Huh? And when you squelch that inner life force, I think that's the real meaning of sin. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. You die. You will most surely die when you do that. Huh? But w first of all, we took this, this love inner dynamism just to ourselves we pulled it out of nature. It wasn't in water. It wasn't in mountains. It wasn't in flowers. It wasn't in trees. I have a black lab. It wasn't in black labs. It was just in, well, you see, once you go on that course of a theology of scarcity, it's always smaller, never bigger. So basically it was white Europeans, you know. We had the, uh, the divine image. And pretty soon we were all hating one another between Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox. Uh, even we couldn't decide that we all had it. Instead of God being everywhere, as the Baltimore Catechism said, let's be honest, God was almost nowhere. And that's the inert, empty, lonely universe that so many of our people are trying to grow up in. Hmm? You know, once I learned, and this is very Franciscan, I don't know how much you know about the life of Francis. Of course, it was my order that started the state of California, you know. <laughs> we, we are in the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area, yeah. named after St. Francis. All these missions uh, were ours. But uh, one of the reasons the Franciscan movement flourished so much in that earlier period is because we, we first love God in the natural world. Where they built these missions were always beautiful places with beautiful architecture that God and beauty were supposed to be one. I'm not saying we did everything perfectly. They were still victims of the 17th and 18th century when they came here. But um, we, uh, we, we recognize that if, if you don't honor God everywhere 
in all of creation, in all of the species, you end up little by little honoring God nowhere. It's, it's, it's up to the individual ego to pick and choose. And once we leave that to you, look at our politics. Huh? Look at the hateful character of our politics. Huh? Just makes you want to cry. We must be the laughing stock of the world, of the world. This, this great, highly developed Christian country. <laughs> oh, my God, it just makes you. But, but it's, it's not even what this conference is about that I'm speaking here is on non-dual thinking. It was my book, Naked Now. We train people in either or, that's called dualistic thinking, where you frame everything in terms of Republican, Democrat, gay, straight, black, white, Catholic, Protestant, American, non-American, and you think because you chose one of those alternatives that you're smart. That's called dualistic thinking. And it's what we're stuck with right now, you see. So, I, I told you before I was going to stop. I will stop yeah. on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the law of three is an inherent dynamic principle of flow. The law of three was made to order to undercut the law of two. The law of two is always antagonistic, oppositional, competitive. The mind chooses sides within a nanosecond. Once you give people a choice of two, watch your mind. Don't believe me. You will always choose one side to be higher and one side to be lower. That's why we still have racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, all the other things that are destroying us. The God as a flow. God is a dynamism, an inner dynamism that we call love, and that's no longer a sentimental word. Uh, that was supposed to define reality from the bottom up. Mm. And I think it still has the power to. You know? yeah. It still has the power to, but boy, we got a lot of makeup work to do, don't we? Yeah, okay. yeah and thank you for that answer. And you actually were going um, the direction that oh, you know, one of our questions we wanted to ask, which was about science, science and faith, mm -hmm. uh, going back to what you said to evolution. And you know, this being Google, a very scientific organization yeah. that's prided itself on you know, the leading science engineering feats. And we kind of see even those of us who want to live a spiritual, mystic life, you know, kind of afraid to come yeah. out with that because faith and science is been viewed as clashing within the last hundred years. So, you know, even what you present with this idea of flow, does that change the way maybe science and faith can interact in coming years? I really think so. And I don't think that's pushing the envelope even. Uh, uh, of course, now we're calling it quantum physics. And that's <laughs> pretty much rearranged the nature of physics. <laughs> you know, Newtonian physics, it was all linear, direct line, this movement moves that, moves that. Mm -hmm. But now when we know that all movement, in fact, is quantum, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's one of the major reasons this doctrine of the Trinity is being rediscovered in our time. We now have a, a science and a theology that match uh, mm -hmm. for people who are willing to take the time to see the match. Uh, mm -hmm. Not everybody probably does. But we no longer need to see, nor should you see, the scientific mind as an enemy to religion. Let me just put it in this simple way. When we say the Christ, Colossians says, is the image of the invisible God. He holds together the spiritual and the material, the divine and the human in one and reconciles them all. If you've ever seen an orthodox icon, the Christ in iconography is always holding up two fingers. That is not Churchill's victory sign. All right? It has nothing to do with the peace sign of the 1960s. All right? This is what is used for 1,800 years. It means I'm holding the two worlds together. Let me use a different word. Can we recognize, and uh, after the scientific age, we weren't prepared to recognize this, uh, that everything has a physical and a psychic dimension. Let me use mm. physical and psychic instead of matter and spirit, if that helps in many ways. In other words, I believe, and this is going to sound new agey and some of you are going to write me off, but I think all the physical universe has a psychic dimension to it. Mm. I think there's more and more evidence that animals and plants and elements and species hold a rudimentary level of consciousness. There's, there's reciprocity going on 
between us and the natural world. Uh, once we learn to respect the inner spiritual psychic, use any of those words interchangeably, consciousness, we're yeah. back to consciousness again, uh, and to recognize it's, it's universally shared. We were supposed to be those who not just knew, but knew that we knew, which is called consciousness in some, by some people. Um, we were supposed to be able to honor the consciousness in all other species. And even the Psalms, for those of you raised praying with the Psalms, how many of the Psalms don't say, the rivers clap their hands, the mountains give praise to God? Huh? Clearly, this inherent connection between nature and God. And they didn't, the native religions, the ones we call pagans, dang it, <laughs> you know, when Pope uh, John Paul II uh, spoke to the native peoples in Phoenix 25 years ago, he made a statement that the conservative Catholics have never forgiven him for. He said, you native peoples already saw the great spirit in all things. Huh? We have to teach Catholics that and they still don't believe it. You understand? <laughs> uh, so in some ways, in some ways we went backwards even though the Christ was supposed to put the psychic and the physical together and say they're one in me. I'm not. So what's happened, we've come now from a 300 year period where the sciences said we will clarify the physical mm -hmm. and we so-called spiritual people said, well, we'll hold the other pole and we'll clarify the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And we talked in two different camps. Huh? We just kept trying to justify the spiritual, disconnected to the natural physical universe, and we became more and more naive. Uh, I mean, even Einstein said this. He had a better quote. I won't come to mind now, but <laughs> that one of those without the other is dangerous, one of the other is stupid. It's, it's a better quote. You know the quote, yeah. Uh, but what's coming together is we got to recognize the psychic and the physical are one world. If you prefer the words spiritual and material or divine and human, that's fine. I don't care what words you use, but we got to get back to one universe. And um, we Christian people too often became overly spiritual, mm -hmm. whereas the whole trump card of Christianity uh, we see in the prologue to John's gospel is the word became flesh. Eh? That's the big one-liner, you know, that's supposed to represent Christianity. That the eternal Tao, if you're a Taoist, <laughs> the eternal blueprint, the eternal pattern of reality took on physicality. Huh? Mm. And they are no longer, they never were two different worlds. They've been one world since the Big Bang. Uh, let me give one more metaphor to, to show you I do love Scripture. I know some of you are evangelical probably. That was actually my field with Scripture, my primary love. Uh, the very first two verses of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. It's probably translated in your Bible, the Spirit hovered over the void or hovered over chaos. The word is chaos, at least in one translation. But the verb used there, I only learned this in the last few years, is actually the word for a brood hen or a mother wafting her wings, warming the eggs, or protecting her chicks. It's a feminine metaphor for God, the very beginning of the Bible. This is not the, the fiat uh, that we see in Michelangelo's, you know, the masculine image of one moment of creation. But the very first two verses of the Bible are evolutionary. Mm -hmm. We have a feminine image of God as a brood hen as a mother uh, taking care of her little chicks, warming them. Mm -hmm. And that's how the whole thing begins. You know? If you want to make a lot of Genesis, which I think is worth making a lot of. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I can say those kind of things now because it's almost because we have the language to say it. Mm -hmm. And we have the scholar, we have good scriptural scholarship to tell me, I mean, I don't know Hebrew verbs, but I, I can study people who know Hebrew verbs and tell me that and say, this is beautiful. This is good stuff, you know. Yeah. So we just have access. 
So one more plug for Google and Apple, you know. <laughs> You're the people who are giving us that kind of access. I would have never had it. I was raised in, educated in theology, not in science. But now for me to remain aloof from science is at this point in history, culpable, chosen ignorance. You understand? I can't just remain in my little Catholic tribe, which isn't now very universal in that sense. But I finally got to be what, you know, you know the word Catholic in Greek means universal. Mm. We were supposed to be universalists, you know. And maybe 2,000 years later, we're finally getting there. Yeah. Well, and that goes a good um, last question I have for you before we open it up for oh, one yeah. or two questions in the room. But then that's, uh, so you use the phrase that we each have this DNA of God in us. Mm -hmm. So using this idea. And we so that, I think, is really where it clicked for me. Because the idea of Trinity for me, I explained it before. It's like it's the water ice phenomenon. I don't know. But the way you explain it, it kind of is what clicked of like, oh, this is how we apply it to our lives. So yeah. maybe if you could just explain that a little bit more. You know, just so you don't, there are several scriptures, again, for those of you from the good scriptural background. Romans 1.20 says, everything that you need to know about God is revealed in the natural world. Romans 1.20, read it, right? It's also said in the book of Job, I think it's chapter 28, 29, I'm not certain of that. In the book of Wisdom, which isn't in the Protestant Bible, they all three say that, that creation reflects the Creator. Mm -hmm. That there has to be an inherent connection, uh, and I, the word I use there is the DNA of the divine has to be in the creature. Just like if you have a child someday, your little DNA is going to be in that little baby. So if we are children of God, we have to carry in some level, I'm not smart enough to know how to explain it, the divine DNA. And that is not something you get by being baptized, I was baptized. If you were baptized, that's wonderful. It's a wonderful ritual symbol of the reality. But I can show you centuries of Catholics who had gallons of water poured over them and who weren't transformed in even a minimal sense. They were greedy, hateful, materialistic, gluttonous, and everything else, you understand? I'm not putting them down, it's just they relied upon the external and there was no psychic inner connection between the physical and the, and the spiritual. So um, until the Christian religion starts announcing to the people of God that their connection with God is objective, inherent, ontological, metaphysical from the moment of your conception, it's nothing you can merit by obeying commandments, going to church on Sunday, are getting baptized. I hope you're baptized. I hope you go to church on Sunday, I guess, unless he's really preaching regressive stuff. Um, uh, and I hope you're a moral person. Uh, it's wonderful to be around moral. You're on a very moral campus right here from what I hear. But, but God already loved you before you were moral. Do you understand? <laughs> Because you carry, it's like a mother cannot not love that dang little kid who's causing her so much trouble. Right? And a daddy cannot not love. Uh, that's what the early mystics said, to get back to the mystics. God cannot not see God's self in you. God cannot not. God cannot not love what God has created. It's a done deal. Do you see how this finally makes everything belong? And it's no longer up to you to decide who's in and who's out. It's a waste of time. It's an absolute waste of time. And a large percentage of Christians are still deciding whether they can like gay people. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's your problem. It's not God's problem, do you understand? But, but we, what we did is we created a God, you know, sort of to fit our capacity for love. And our capacity for love was pretty small. And we'd heard all these stories about God making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice, torturing his enemies for all eternity. So we were just programmed not to believe that, not to believe the great good news. But we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can talk this way in most countries, and it's amazing. I don't get much pushback. I thought you uh, eloquently stated 
how loneliness is the kind of mm, anti-God mm. way of thinking. And I think this is really important for us at Google because, say, the generation I come from, the millennial generation, that we have you know, thousands of friends on Facebook. We are connected by so many people on our mobile phones, but we are a generation that admits being more lonely than ever, that we don't have that friend we can cry with. We don't have that person that mm. will always be there for us. And so you, know, you had some ideas on that. So could you elaborate more how even the Trinity helps wow, us think I'd of love to think of loneliness and community? Yeah. See, if you can have love is an inner presence to the interiority of anything. To be present to the innards of anything is to love it. Mm -hmm. Once you can do that, that you can honor, do you have a pond here, the fish in the pond, or mm -hmm. the bird in the tree, and interface is possible. Loneliness is no longer an issue. There's a, mm. when, when I did, did my hermitages, uh, which were usually 40 days, I would get happier by the last weeks. Do you understand? Where, where it was just universal connection. Mm. You know? Uh, this celibacy thing that I got connected with far too young, I'm afraid to say. But uh, uh, now I know it's highly possible. That, uh, mm -hmm. when, you can, uh, when you can enjoy intimacy with everything all the time, mm -hmm. uh, you can, believe it or not, live happily and fulfilled without the normal sexual encounter you know, mm -hmm. because you're enjoying communion all the time with human eyes and human hearts. And, and that's what really satisfies, you know, that's what really, I'm not here to make a push for celibacy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it works with very few people actually. But, but uh, uh, if it does work, it's only because you've achieved that mystical communion, mm -hmm. understand? that you can be happy all day. Mm -hmm. So you said it well, Nick, that we live in a very lonely world where we're not connected to anything intimately we know things by their surface, but not by their soul. So when you meet things, what the three persons of the Trinity are, are three who know one another subject to subject, center to center, allowing total diversity and yet being in communion. This is the answer to diversity and communion. The Father does not try to make the Son into the Father. The Spirit does not try to make the Son into the Spirit. They outpour empty and fill up, empty and fill up. St. Bonaventure, our Franciscan mystic, Ventura is named after him. Uh, you know, uh, he, he said, picture God as a, as a water wheel of just three buckets emptying themselves totally and flipping back and allowing themselves to be filled. That is, we believe, the template of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a big statement I just yeah. made. That is the, that's how love works. That's how the universe works. Everything has to die to its present form to receive a new form. And you can't do that unless you can be assured you're going to be filled up. Now, what we live in is in a culture of scarcity where you can't let go, you can't give up, because you're not sure anybody's going to be there to fill you up, are you? And without that, we remain autonomous, self-sufficient entities. That's probably more an answer than you wanted, but yeah, thank, yeah. You so thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right.